you all for coming here tonight. We're going to go ahead and get the program started. Um, for those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Jeremy Jackson. I'm the director for the Center of Study of Public Choice and Private Enterprise. And I'm an assistant professor, actually, I'm an associate professor in the Department of Agribusiness and Applied Economics. And we're bringing you this program today. The center has, as its mission, engaging in research and educational programs like this one to uncover the institutions and policies that encourage and enhance human well-being. So we're after uncovering what can make people's lives better off, which I think is exactly what we're going to be talking about um, as we get into the presentation in a few minutes. Um, I do want to say that we, we have a social media presence, so you can find out about events like this one and others that we're going to have. If you like us on Facebook, we also have um, a Twitter account. We won't spam you too much. Um, but do connect with us on social media. We also do have a number of programs for students in addition to things like this event today. Our flagship um, student program is our Mansur Olson Scholars Program, which is a reading group where students meet basically about every other week, do some readings, and talk about the readings. Um, doc, our own Dr. Jim Payton is leading the reading group. And next fall, He's going to be leading a group on the topic evolution and entrepreneurship. And besides getting together with just really awesome people to talk about really awesome ideas, you also get the opportunity to earn scholarship along with that. So there is a $500 scholarship that we give to students for participating in the group. And we will have applications opening up for that um, in April. So actually, we'll start reply. Applications will be opening up on March 1st with a deadline of April 3rd. So look for that. Again, another reason to like us on Facebook is that you'll get reminded about um, that um, sign up later on. The other thing that I want to mention to you while I have your ears is that we have another event happening later in April again. Okay? So we're hosting Michael Matheson Miller, who is a scholar with the Acton Institute. He directed and produced a um, documentary called Poverty Inc. Some of you may have seen it. It was available for a time on, on, Net on Netflix. But we're hosting him here, and we're going to do a public screening of that documentary. And we're actually going to have that, that screening at the Fargo Theater on April 25th at 7 PM. The following evening, we're going to host another event like this one, where he will give a presentation with the time for some more Q&A. But both of those events are coming up um, later on in April, so stay tuned to get more information about those as we go along as well. And with that, I want to go ahead and introduce our speaker for tonight. Stephen Moore is a distinguished visiting fellow for the Project for Economic Growth at the Heritage Foundation. He works on budget, fiscal, and monetary policy issues. And during the 2016 presidential campaign, he served as senior economic advisor to Donald Trump and drafted early versions of the Trump tax plan. He formally wrote on the economy and public policy for the Wall Street Journal and was a member of the journal's editorial board. He also founded the Free Enterprise Fund and the Club for Growth, where he served as president. He returned to Heritage in 2014, about 25 years after his tenure, as the Grover M. Herman Fellow in Budgetary Affairs from 1984 to 87. He received his bachelor's degree from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and a Master of Arts in Economics from George Mason University. So please join me as we introduce Stephen Moore.
with uh, a lot of the business men and women of this state, and I, I mentioned that I think North Dakota has an incredibly uh, bright future, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But uh, a couple things. First of all, I want to make this conversational, so if you, as I'm going to throw out some ideas about how we can make the economy grow faster a little bit, talk maybe a little bit about Donald Trump and his economic agenda. And if you have any, as I go along, uh, if you have a comment or question or criticism, um, just raise your hand and we'll stop and we'll discuss these things. So uh, I want you all to get the, the most out of this as you can. Uh, and I thought I'd start by giving you all um, some advice about someone who has been in economics now for uh, over 35 years and has had a pretty blessed career. I've worked, I've had some pretty cool jobs. I've worked at the Wall Street Journal and I've uh, you know, worked at uh, some of the great think tanks and just had had, you know, as an advisor to, to now President Donald Trump. And so it's been, you know, I've been very lucky in what I've been doing. I've always loved every job I've had. And, you know, I thought I'd just give you all some advice about how to, you know, because you're all thinking about what, what is my career path? What do I want to do with my life when I get out of MDSU? And I, so I want to suggest a couple things. So one is, um, one of the most important things, I believe, is to do what you love. If, if don't follow the money, do what you love. And if you've got a passion for something, do it. You know, now that doesn't mean, you know, some of you in this room might want to be a professional football player. And, you know, that probably isn't gonna happen, or you're you know, a rock star or something like that. But I mean, follow your passion, because, um, you know, you're gonna spend, you know, at least half of your life working, right? And you want, you're gonna be good at it, and you're going to be happy if it's something that you are good at, you know, feel um, like it's something that you love. Um, the second piece of advice is, how many of you in this room have a job? So a lot of you do, that's great. I think one of the most important things for young people, uh, especially people in college, is to work while you're in school. So if you're not working right now, have a job. Because you can oftentimes learn much more you know, look, you're going to get a great education, you've gotten a great education here, but oftentimes you're going to learn a lot more from actually doing things and being out on the, in the workforce than being in a classroom. And by the way, you're going to get a lot, a lot more out of what you learn in your classroom if you're also working at the same time. And by the way, you'll appreciate your, your classes more if you actually have to work um, to, uh, to help pay your tuition or whatever it is. So, so again, by the way, the studies are very crystal clear on this that people who start working at a younger age over time have higher earnings than people who start working at a later age. So somebody who starts working at 16 years old has higher lifetime earnings than someone who works at, starts working at, say, 20 years old and so on. So there's, there's a lot of value in uh, getting a job and learning on the job. Um, third of all, my third piece of advice to you is start investing when you are young. Most of you in this room, as I stand the room, um, I see some, you know, you know, some older people in this room, but most of you probably are in your, you know, late teens, early twenties. Um, one of the most important ways you can get rich is start investing money when you are young. So if you have a job, take, be disciplined about it. Take 15 or 20 percent of what you earn if you can, or maybe more, and start saving that money. Because there's an old saying, I think it was Albert Einstein, who said that the most powerful force in the universe is compound interest. If you start saving now, and you're saving for, let's say, 25 or 30 or 35 or 40 years, the effect of that saving today, 25 or 30 or 40 years ago, is going to be enormous. You're going to make 100 times out of your money if you start investing early. And that means just put your money in an index fund and just, just save. We need to get it, have a saving culture. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about Trump and Trump economics. And by the way, if you want to ask a question about Trump, uh, well, let me, let me ask you all, because I want this to be participatory. How many, well, I'd like to know the people I'm, I'm, uh, I'm talking to. How many of you in this room have a positive opinion about Donald Trump? Raise your hand. How many of you have a negative opinion about Donald Trump? Maybe a, a little less than that. How many of you are still on the side? <laughs> okay, here you go. Okay. So I'm, by the way, I'm not here by any means to trying to sell Donald Trump on you. I, I, I worked for him, you obviously had your eyes, I'm very much in favor of him, but I'm, I, my purpose here today is not to give you some kind of political pitch for Donald Trump. The truth is that there is, with Donald Trump, in my opinion, there is a good and a bad and an ugly with Donald Trump. And every night when I say my prayers at night, I just pray that the good triumphs over the 
bad and the ugly with Donald Trump because you know, he's a multifaceted person who likes Homeland. But I do think that uh, Donald Trump has a pretty impressive economic agenda, and I thought I'd kind of walk you through it. I hoped uh, with a lot of the stuff. My main job with Donald Trump when I met him two years ago was he asked me to help write his tax plan. So the, uh, another economist and I were involved in writing the tax plan that was uh, signed into law. Um, what was that? You know, a couple of days before Christmas, and uh, so that you know, I was very integrally involved for the whole two years that that whole process took place. I also traveled a lot with Donald Trump. I, I flew with them. I went to a lot of events and so on. So I got to know him uh, uh, very well. So, but let's talk about policy because that's why we're here. So let me start with this. Why were why were the American people so angry in 2016? This is something that mystifies a lot of people. Why was there this sort of sense among Trump? from voters all over the country, especially in places like Michigan, Ohio, or Pennsylvania, and Iowa, and Wisconsin, the Midwestern, sort of what they call the Rust Belt states. Why did so many of these voters um, turn away from the Democrats, and why did they take a chance with Donald Trump? And I would say that the major, one major reason was that the economy was not doing very well uh, in the last 10 years. It obviously did horrible under, under Bush in his last two years in office when when the economy collapsed and we had a real estate crisis. And then um, under Obama, we had a recovery, but it was a very weak recovery. It was the weakest recovery from a recession that we had since World War II. And you can see, you know, th what this chart is showing you is, I think, an explanation of why Americans felt so financially stressed out um, at the end of Obama's second term. And that bottom line is the pace of growth of the U.S. economy um, under Obama from the time that the recovery began, which was June of 2009. Now, let me say this inside. I'm not here to bash Barack Obama by any means. Um, this was a lengthy recovery. It was, it was a durable recovery, but it was an extremely shallow recovery. It was an anemic, weak recovery, but it was long. I mean, we're now, we're still in this recovery. And in fact, the good news is the recovery is picking up steam. It's not slowing down. But over the eight years that since um, the recovery began, you can see the economy grew by about 15% in real terms. That's a economic a growth rate of about 1.9%. Um, that compares with the light blue line is the average recovery. So we got about eight or nine recessions since the end of World War II. And what we looked at is what was the average you know, um, rate of growth that the economy grows normally during the recovery period, and that was about 29% or about twice as bad. And then the red line is the is the Reagan recovery. I'm a little biased. I also you know, you know, worked with Ronald Reagan in the late 1980s. And Reagan's philosophy was basically free markets. It was basically cut taxes, cut regulation, uh, you know, reduce inflation by getting the money supply under control. And in a word, you know, Reagan said very famously in his debate against Jimmy Carter in 1980, uh, government is not the solution, government is the problem. That was the Reagan philosophy. Very different from Obama's philosophy where we had government stimulus programs, you had Obamacare, you had the Federal, the Federal Reserve um, uh, uh, putting literally trillions of dollars of additional cash into the economy to try to jumpstart growth. The economy would be about $3 trillion larger today if the economy had grown as fast under Obama as it had under Reagan. And the question is why? Why was there that, that $3 trillion growth gap? Um, now, let me show you a couple things that I think are important. Um, the, one of the biggest problems we have as a nation, it's not the biggest, but it is a problem, is our national debt. You all know this, that we're running large budget deficits every year. We've been running trillion dollar deficits now for the last decade or so. And you know, the best way to measure our national debt is to measure the debt as a share of our economy. So based on how big our economy, you know, if you've got a country that has a $20 trillion economy like the United States, we can afford more debt than a country that has maybe a $2 trillion economy, right? So you want to measure these uh, uh, standardized by how big the economy is. And I would argue that as long as the economy is going faster than the debt, we're okay. But when the debt starts going faster than the economy, then you're, you have a rising debt burden and you have a danger of getting into a debt spiral. So you can see from this picture what happened in the last two years of of Bush and then under Obama, the debt went up and up and up and up and up, but by an astounding amount. We, have, we doubled our national debt in 10 years. And what's interesting is the projection. So the projection is that red line is showing um, the what congressional budget office, they're the you know, official scores about where our fiscal situation is headed. So I, I just took it right out of their, um, right out of their uh, annual report. 
they're projecting that the national debt will continue to rise at a very alarming and accelerating rate over the next 20 years, so much so that our debt would go to about 150% of our GDP. Now, that is a problem. <laughs> when you have a debt that's 150% of GDP, the alarm bells have to start going off. That's the area of debt that would, would be like Greece or Puerto Rico or Detroit, where you get, what happens is your debt gets so large that when your revenues come in, all you're doing is paying off the interest on the debt. You can't even pay for your services. So I would make the case that we can't let, we can't let that future happen, right? Or you, you all are in big, big trouble because you're the workers who are gonna have to pay off that debt. The biggest thing that's happened in our economy now is this demographic time value. You're exactly right, sir. So right now we have um, a baby boom generation. I'm a boomer, I was born in 1960. Anyone born between 1948 and 1964 is a baby boomer. We're by far the biggest generation of it. There are 82 million baby boomers. So there are, that's a lot of people. And we are retiring now at the pace of about 10,000 people every day. Every day, 10,000 more baby boomers retire. And think about what that means. When somebody retires, they cease working, right, by definition, because they're leaving the workforce. So prior to retiring, they were working and paying taxes into the system. Once they retire, they're actually collecting the very entitlements they were talking about, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and so on. So that is the driving force. It's demographics. There's no saying demographics is destiny. And that is clearly one of the big factors why that decline is going on. By the way, when I said demographics is destiny, that's not exactly true because there are ways that we can deal with this aging of the population crisis. Now, what are, what are things that could happen that would change the, this demographic situation? There's one thing in particular we could do as a nation that would uh, that would help this situation along. What is that? Somebody shout it out. What word am I looking for? How do we get more workers? Immigration. Immigration. Okay. We have one advantage over every other country in the world, virtually every other country in the world, which is that we've got millions, tens of millions of people who are young who want to come to the United States. Right? It's a wonderful problem to have. I'm, I, one of the areas where I disagree with Donald Trump, you know, I do think we should make sure that immigrants who come into this country are legal. But my God, we shouldn't be reducing legal immigration. We should in increase legal immigration. We need the young workers. We have this incredible opportunity to bring in, you know, literally millions of people who start working right away, and they will smooth out that, that demographic uh, problem. And, you know, they, a lot of these people, I like this idea of having a, reward, a system that's based on merit, so you give people points based on, you know, you know, what kind of degrees they have, they speak English, what kind of skills they have, people who can help build our American economy, and that would help reduce that line. But the other point about this, the main point I, I want to make with this chart, is look at the blue line. That's um, based on a slight change that I made in the Congressional Budget Office forecast. The Congressional Budget Office is forecasting, I think this is the single biggest problem in the United States uh, right now, if this were to come to pass, they are projecting that the U.S. economy will grow by less than 2%, about 1.8 or 1.9% for the next 20 years. Well, hell no, we can't let that happen. Right? We can't grow by 1.8 or 9%. Or 9 we have to grow a lot faster than that. If we can have faster growth than almost every other problem that you might be concerned about, whether it's income inequality, poverty, bad schools, the infrastructure, uh, you know, the debt, all of these problems are made so much easier to solve if the economy is growing faster. So what I did is I said, well, wait a minute, what, what if they're wrong? What if we don't grow 1.8%, what if we grow at 3%? Now, that may not seem like a big difference, the difference between 1.8 and 3%, but over time, it has a huge impact. And so all I did, I just took their numbers and said, no, we don't grow at 1.8%, we grow at 3%, look at what happens to the debt. The debt actually goes down every year in, in, in the real dollars it increases, but the share of our economy it goes down, it becomes less of a burden to future generation. And so the reason I show you that is a very simple truism. Growth is everything. We have to grow this economy much faster. And I think one area where I, I in full agreement with Trump is, he is focused like a laser beam on growth and employment and jobs and higher wages, which is exactly, by the way, what the American people want. They want more jobs, they want higher salaries, they want more income for their family, and so on. If we get higher growth, then, then that problem of, of, the, um, of the debt would be uh, not, not solved, but much easier to deal with. Now, um, I'm gonna skip that. 
Okay, so this is pertinent to this state of North Dakota. One reason I'm, I'm very bullish on North Dakota, I'm not bullish on the US economy, but I'm really bullish on North Dakota because North Dakota helped lead the US economy out of the recession. In fact, if it had not been for about four states, North Dakota, Texas, Oklahoma, and, um, and, West, and, uh, and West Virginia, we probably would not have gotten out of the recession. The biggest story of the US economy over the last decade is shale, oil, and gas. So we're right back in the middle of one of the biggest deposits of shale, oil, and gas right here in Fargo, North Dakota. And this is an amazing story. It's a story of innovation, it's a story of entrepreneurship, and it's a story of incredible um, technological prowess in the United States. This was invented here in the United States by so many great inventions. This is one of the great inventions. Um, horizontal drilling and fracking are amazing technology that have completely revolutionized the energy picture. So much so that as recently as literally, you know, in the early 1990s, I mean, in the early, um, when, in the early uh, years that uh, uh, Barack Obama was president, he was running around the country saying, um, we have to use um, you know, green energy because America is running out of oil and gas. And pretty soon we're going to drill the last drill of oil and we get out of the mountain. Well, that was complete nonsense, right? America, as you know, you know this, you all live here in North Dakota. The United States is not running out of oil and gas, we're running into it big time. We have more of this oil and gas thanks to fracking and horizontal drilling than any other country in the world. We have at least 250 years worth of oil and gas. We have 500 years worth of coal. We're not running out of this stuff. I mean, that is an absolute fact. We're not ever going to run out of this stuff. And you can see, I mean, just because of horizontal drilling and uh, fracking, we've almost tripled the amount of oil and gas we have. We are technically uh, capable of retrieving. Anyway, this green line is showing what's happened with our output. And so much of this did happen in North Dakota. And that's one of the great reasons that North Dakota has the lowest unemployment rate in the country is we're producing massive amounts of jobs in the oil and gas industry. The green line is the oil and gas jobs. The yellow line is the uh, is basically the line that shows uh, employment in every other industry. Shale oil and gas is what got us out of recession. Uh, one repercussion of this, a positive repercussion for the rest of the country, is the massive increase in oil and gas production has led to. If you produce more of something, what happens to its price? Falls, right? And so what's happened with the oil and gas, and by the way, this is this actually hurt the North Dakota economy. You were almost victims of your own success. We were producing so much oil and gas in, in North Dakota, and, and we were bringing huge amounts of uh, numbers of barrels of oil online. Guess what? The price of oil and gas fell dramatically in 2014. Um, it went from $110 a barrel, and today I think it's around $60. That's a big deal. That $50 a barrel reduction in the, in the price of oil is the equivalent of a huge tax cut for American industry and American families. We estimate that every dollar reduction in the uh, in the price of oil uh, puts about ten dollars of increased output into the U.S. economy, and so that's a good news story for anybody who's a motorist or anyone who uses electricity or energy. Um, now, I, I wanted to make this point because I just think it's really important. Um, the oil and gas. Let me put it very simple. We are a twenty trillion dollar industrial economy. We make things. We're, we make cars. We make steel. We make, uh, you know, technology and all this stuff. Uh, you know, we're an industrial age economy. Um, we, if we're going to continue to prosper, we're going to need to use oil and gas, you know, because this is a very efficient way to generate electricity. Uh, that's not to say renewable energy isn't important. Um, it's it's a it's a it's a niche fuel, and you know, you actually produce a lot of wind fuel, wind um, energy here in the United States because you have high winds in the state. But you know, green energy is still relatively insignificant, um, and it will remain relatively insignificant for at least the next 20 years. Um, last year, I'll just give you one example. Of all our electricity generation in the United States, nationwide, anybody want to guess at what percentage of our electricity was generated from solar power last year? Anybody want to take a guess? One percent. One percent of our electricity comes from uh, solar power. I think the number for wind, that wind is up to, I think, about or 5%. So let's say combined we're getting about 6% of our electricity generation from, uh, from renewables. The vast majority of it comes from oil, gas, and coal. So we're going to need to use that stuff and the good news is we have a whole heck of a lot of it. Okay. Now, what about pollution? You know, you hear this all the time. We can't use our fossil fuels because we have to care about emissions and so on. We have 
everyone in this room, we all want clean air and clean water. That's one of the most important public goods out there. The good news is that over all of your lifetimes, and even over most of my lifetime, we've been dramatically reducing pollution levels. In fact, that may surprise you. Most of the people think pollution levels are worse today than they were 25 or 50 or 100 years ago. That's nonsense. Pollution is on the on on decline in a big, big way. It's not nonsense. If you compare the major cities today, the air pollution levels and the water pollution levels today versus 50 years ago, they, the, the lakes and the rivers and the streams and the air quality is much, much better today than it was before. So we, my point is we can have strong economic growth and we can have a clean environment. So that's good news for us. Now, this is one I, just, I felt compelled to show you this because one of my challenges as an economist is to figure out how I can relate to you all the superiority of capitalism over socialism. And I think that this one chart probably is the single best way to relate this story to you um, than any other single chart I could possibly find. Now, how many of you have seen this before? Raise your hand. A lot, most of you have. So the, for those of you who haven't, this is just basically a satellite photo of Korea over at, at night. And you can see the white splotches are the areas of light at night where there's electricity being used, and the black areas are places where you know, that are essentially in the dark. You can see that one little white splotch there in North Korea. That's like King Jong's castle. <laughs> He's the only place that has electricity at night. And then you can see in South Korea, I mean, that's a really amazing thing. A huge white splotch there, obviously, Seoul, South Korea. I was just in Korea this, uh, this summer. Uh, South Korea, I mean, Seoul is industrial city. It's like four times as big as Chicago. Gigantic city. Uh, it's right on the uh, DMZ, the demilitarized zone. And you can see that, you know, there is a, there is a big difference between those two areas. And, and so much so, I mean, that the average South Korean has a living standard in terms of income that's about three times, three to four times higher than the average person who lives in North Korea. Now, why is that interesting? It's because this is one of the great natural experiments of all time in economics, right? And the reason it's such an incredibly great um, experiment is North and South Korea are, are the same in every single possible way. Right? There's nothing different about North and South Korea. They have the same DNA, they have the same culture, they have the same language, they have the same geography, they have the same natural resources. Everything is the same about these countries except one thing. There's this arbitrary line in the sand. <laughs> On one side is I don't know, socialism, you know, uh, communism, Bernie Sandersism, whatever, whatever you want to call it. It's government control of the economy. On the other side is where you have a basically, uh, not fully, but a free market capitalist system. And that, I think, explains why uh, capitalism is such, such a superior mode of organization than, uh, than social. Unless anyone else here has another explanation. I mean, I, yeah. What about the rest of the world? Hold on. Same case in a, in a small way I made about North and South Korea. So what's happening in America today? This may be the single most important trend in America that people aren't paying enough attention to. 
is the red states, and I don't mean red as in Republican, rah, rah, Republican. I mean red states in terms of lower regulation, less tax, and so on, are dramatically outpacing in economic performance the blue states. And this is incontrovertible, and you're seeing massive amounts of jobs and people and capital leaving blue states and then moving to the red states. By the way, for the most part, that's a migration of people from the north to the south. Um, and so the way that's what, so we estimate about a thousand people every day are leaving blue states like California, New York, New Jersey, kind of <coughs> my home state of Illinois, and they're going to red states. So the migration is all kind of in one direction. Now there are always a few exceptions to this, but the best way of looking at this is just looking at the four biggest states in the United States. Texas, Florida, California, New York. Those four states account for one out of three Americans. One third of Americans live in those four states. So their impact on the country is outsized because they're you know, hugely populated states. Well, Texas and Florida are states that are pretty, they're very low. Does anybody know what the income tax rate is in Texas and Florida? Zero. There is no income tax in, in Texas and Florida. California and New York have tax rates of 13%. Their highest tax rate is 13%, so they, they soak the rich with high tax rates. Texas and Florida are states that are right to work. They don't require people to join unions. Um, New York and California are forced union states. Texas and Florida allow drilling and pro energy production. New York and California not. They're very different in terms of their orientation. Now, what's interesting about this is Texas and Florida have gained, on average, about a million people from other states over the last decade. Whereas New York and California have lost a million people each, more than a million people each. That is to say, people are voting with their feet. They're leaving New York, they're leaving California, they're leaving New Jersey, they're leaving Connecticut, they're leaving Illinois, they're losing, leaving um, states like Minnesota, and they're going to these red states. Now, when I, do any of you know in this room know who Paul Krugman is? Uh, Paul Krugman is a, a very liberal economist. He's probably the most He's probably the most influential liberal economist in the country. He and I debate each other all the time. Uh, he is a Nobel Prize in economics. He writes twice a week from the, from the, the Times. I used to be the chief economics writer for the Wall Street Journal, so we used to, they used to pair us off a lot. And, you know, he's much more in favor of the blue state model, and obviously I'm in favor of the red state model. So one time I was debating him, and I showed him this very chart. And I said, Paul Krugman, um, you have to explain this to me, because New York and California do everything that you advise every day. They have high taxes, high regulation, all of these policies that are very liberal. And Texas and Florida do exactly the opposite of what you recommend. And yet, people are leaving New York and California and going to Texas and Florida. You know, what gives? I mean, I'll go ahead and get your question. And, and, and he looked at this and he said, well, look, there's a very easy explanation for this. He said, the reason people are moving from the north to the south is because of the weather. Now, by the way, that's not a completely stupid yeah, sir. I mean, I'll be frank with you. Yesterday, I was in West Palm Beach, Florida, where it was 80 degrees, and here it's 10 degrees. <laughs> you know, all all people, I'd rather be where it's 80 degrees than 10 degrees. So yeah, people, especially as we age, people like to move to places where the, the sun shines more and where the weather is warmer. But this doesn't explain to me. I mean, I have to say, I hit him very hard right below the belt, and I said, "Well, Bob Krugman, that doesn't make that explanation doesn't hold water." And I said. The reason that explanation doesn't hold water is a very, very simple reason. It might be explained why people might leave Rochester, New York, to go to Fort Lauderdale, but why in the world are people leaving San Diego and moving to Houston? Right? Nobody in the right mind would move from San Diego to Houston to the weather, right? Because California is the best weather in the country. There's something else going on here. Now, the reason I told you this is because North Dakota, we, we've made a big change in the tax code. We're no longer letting people deduct from their state, from their federal taxes, their state and local taxes. We put a cap on it. This was one of the policies I strongly advocated for. By the way, it's very pro North Dakota, because it now means people in North Dakota, on your federal taxes, you don't have to subsidize state and local services in states like California, New York, and Canada. You, in this state, you spend about half as much per capita as California and New York do. So that wasn't very fair. I mean, why should people in North Dakota have to pay for services in California? And so we capped that, and that means that the tax burden in California and New York are going to be, be even heavier. And Minnesota is another state that's, Minnesota has a 10% tax rate, and I think in, uh, in North Dakota you're about 4%. My prediction is that you're going to see a lot of people moving out of California, out of Minnesota, out of Illinois, out of Connecticut, at an even further and faster rate. And on one state that a lot of these people are going to come to is the Greatsburg state of North Dakota. You're a big winner because you're 
a state that has relatively low tax rate and you're very pro-business. So that's good news for you. You guys are going to grow a lot faster than the average state. Um, I thought I'd just show you, this is our, just because so many of you are, are, are from North Dakota, you've got a lot to be proud of. We rank the states in terms of their economic outlook every year. So which states have the best economic outlook over the next decade and which states have the worst economic outlook? Outlook, and we base this on a whole variety of factors. You know, um, how how high are the taxes? How high are the regulations? Uh, what, how good are the schools? How good is the uh, you know what, how big are the pension deficits and all these things in these states? And the state look at where North Dakota is. Think about it. you're number four in the country. You're the fourth best economic outlook. This is a good place. It's not uh, it's not by coincidence that North Dakota has the fourth the lowest unemployment rate in the country. Utah, by the way, we've done this study for 10 straight years. Utah is the state every year that's come out number one. There's some, the Mormons just do it right, right? But <laughs> look at the states at the bottom, and this is the sad thing. The states that are really stuck in the muck and are, just have a really rotten forecast are Illinois, Connecticut, California, New York, New Jersey, Vermont, New York. They just do it wrong. They're, you know, and I always like to say that when it comes to economics, they just have to have their trade tables in the upright black position in those in those states and those states are going to relatively lose North Dakota, North Carolina, Indiana, Utah, Texas, and Tennessee are going to benefit. Okay, next, I did, on the on the tax bill. This was what I worked on and this is going to be extremely positive for the US economy. We're already seeing really very beneficial results from the tax bill. Uh, we passed this bill um, in, two days before Christmas. Um, I'm a little biased because I helped write it, I helped draft the bill. But this is, in my opinion, the single most pro-growth piece of legislation in 30 years. You have to go back to the early 1981 Reagan tax cuts, in my opinion, to come up with a bill that is so pro-jobs and pro-growth. And one of the lessons of history, by the way, is lower tax rates do matter. If you, if you look at, you know, when Reagan came into office, you know, the highest tax rate at that time was 70 percent. Reagan came in and cut it from 70 to 50 down to 28 percent. And you can look, you know, and then the rates bounce up and down a little bit, but they remain relatively low. And look at the yellow line. That's the share of taxes paid by the richest 1%. So these are the people, rich people like, you know, uh, Warren Buffett and Bill Gates and, uh, you know, uh, LeBron James and people like that. And look at what's happened there um, tax burden. They, they've actually paid more taxes as the rates came down. That's like a paradox, right? You would think that lower tax rates would mean less revenues paid by the rich, but in fact, it was just the opposite. This was one of the motivations of our bill. It wasn't to give a big tax cut to rich people. It was to have more businesses and enterprise in the United States. And then, um, this is just a great, I just love this quote from John F. Kennedy. Um, Kennedy um, was the first sort of real advocate of, of tax rate reductions in the early 1960s. And he said, I mean, this just should be plastered on the forehead of every politician. It's a paradoxical truth that rates are too high, Revenues are too low, and the soundest way to raise the revenues in the long run is to cut the That's exactly what Reagan said. That's exactly what Donald Trump was saying last year. Um, how is this all working out? This is uh, kind of an interesting chart. This is the heart and soul of the, of the Trump tax cut. We uh, believe, I mean, simply a truism, that the United States had the highest statutory tax rate on our businesses of any country in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, we are in a global economy today. Right? You know, you here in North Dakota, uh, you're not just competing against people in Wisconsin and Minnesota and, you know, California and so on. You're competing against people in Germany and France and Canada and Mexico and China and so on. So we had a tax system which was 40% on our, on our uh, when you put the state and local taxes. We were not way up there and those green pillars you're looking at, that's the average rate of all the countries that we compete in. That's Germany. That's France, that's Spain, that's Canada, that's China, that's Ireland, it's all the other, it's, it's the average rate of Russia. Look at what's happening in the last 25 years. They were engaged in Reaganomics. They were dramatically cutting their rates year after year after year after year after year. Now, why do you think they did that? Do you think these countries, the leaders in these countries, cut these tax rates because they love businesses and they love corporations? No, that's not why they did it. They did it because they wanted to steal jobs from the United States, right? And they wanted to leverage lower tax rates, whether it was Canada or China, to get companies to leave the United States to go to these other countries. And guess what? They were doing that. There was a term for this that was called inversions. We've seen dozens and dozens of major American companies that have essentially renounced their United States citizenship and moved down to the United States, and they moved to Canada, or they moved to China, or they moved to Ireland. In fact, that was just in Ireland 
this past summer. I was in Dublin, you know, I was walking down the streets of Dublin. Dublin, ha Ireland has the lowest corporate tax rate in the world, about 12 and a half percent. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but not much. Every other business I saw in Ireland was an American company that had left the United States and they're relocated in Ireland. But we don't want that. <laughs> we want America first, right? We want jobs in the United States. We don't want American jobs leaving the United States from China and Ireland. And so what we did was we basically said, you know, this is like a 20% head start program for every country we compete with. It's unpatriotic to support a 40% tax rate. All we're doing is losing jobs. So let's get in the game. Let's cut our tax rate. And I guarantee you, by the way, the last thing that China and Germany and Italy and Spain and all these other countries wanted the United States to do was cut the tax, our tax rate. They were totally against it. They were with you know, Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi. They didn't want us to cut our rate because they knew the jig would be up for them. And now we're uh, you know, we're about 25% uh, when we include the state level. That's a big deal. We've gone from the worst in the world to the best. Now, the evidence of this working is pretty powerful. Um, you know, the, my favorite example is what happened um, just about three weeks ago with Apple. Apple is an amazing story. It's the economic story of the year, maybe the economic story of the last half decade. Um, three weeks after the tax cut was enacted, Apple announced that it is bringing $300 billion back to the United States. Not $300 million, $300 billion to the United States. That's a gargantuan number. I mean, it's, it's mind-boggling how much money that is. $300 billion that was invested abroad that's coming to the United States. And that means they're going to build a, one of the things they're going to do is build a campus with 20,000 new workers in technology. Awesome. So for the first time in decades, we're actually insourcing jobs from the rest of the world rather than outsourcing our jobs. Um, they are going to pay $39 billion in taxes. We've had now, by my calculations, about three dozen major United States companies, um, Fortune 200 companies that have paid big, big bonuses and salary increases and uh, benefit increases to their workers. These include AT&T, Verizon, Costco, Walmart, FedEx. I mean, you just go down the list. Almost every major company is doing this. And they're doing it as a result of the tax bill. And that's good news. I mean, what we ultimately wanted in this tax bill was more jobs in the United States and people getting higher wages. And already right out of the gate, you're seeing that. So I'm really, really positive about the benefits of the tax cut. I'll just show you one other kind of thing about why this is important. So that's where we used to be. Now we're right in the game. We're right in the average. So companies aren't going to leave for uh, seeking a lower tax rate any longer. These were the rates that went up under Obama. That was, I think, one of the reasons the economy underperformed is we kept raising taxes when we should have been lowering rates. And then these are the new rates. So we cut the highest income tax rate to 37 percent. We cut the small business tax. By the way, there's 27 million small businesses in this country. They're the heartbeat of America, They're the spinal cord of our economy. Uh, they employ 65% of the workers. So Trump always said, you know, I want to cut the corporate tax, but I also want to cut the big tax for small businesses. So small businesses also get a big rate cut from 45 to 30%. Incidentally, when I talked about, you know, when I was giving you all advice about what you might want to do with your careers, I want to mention one other thing. There is no more noble pursuit, in my opinion, than owning and operating own business. How many of you in, in this room want to do that at some point, own and operate your own business? There's nothing better than you can possibly do. You know, and there's nothing, you know, it's, I've done it, I've got started three businesses, two of them failed, one of them was a success, that's about the batting average. Most basic business, small businesses fail at a two out of three rate, you know, it's a 33% batting average, but there's no better feeling than getting up in the morning, you know, having control of your own time, controlling your own destiny, hiring people, you know, having people dependent on you and your actions is great. I wish everybody had raised their hand and said, someday I want to own and operate my own business because it's an awesome, awesome pursuit. Um, uh, let's see, I'm going to just stop by saying that. So far right now, all of the indicators are very positive for the U.S. economy. Uh, we revved up the growth rate from 2% to 3%. We're seeing more growth in manufacturing, more growth in mining, more growth in construction. Black unemployment rate is down to its lowest level in 30 years. The black labor force participation rate is up. The Latino unemployment rate is down. Uh, consumer confidence is at one of its highest levels. Small business optimism is at its highest level. Stock market's doing really well. Um, it's a good news story. So I mean, I think I'll just stop by saying this. This is a great, great time for you all to be entering your workforce. This is probably the best 
job market in the United States has done in at least 25 years. Um, and so uh, get the skills you need. But what employers want is good skills. If you actually know how to do something that is useful to employers, and that means maybe not having a psychology degree or sociology degree, but actually having a useful skill, you can find a job right away. So I'm going to stop there and maybe take any questions you might have.